Hello. Hello, hello. Volume 15. We are finally here. Why do I have my headphones on? Uh, yeah, I had to get a quick bite to eat. Little grilled chicken, little grilled vegetable kebabs. I'm still picking a little bit of that, of that out of my teeth. But, uh, yeah, we're here. We're ready. We're ready to do this. Mm. I'm all bearded up. Oh. <laughs> all bearded up. <laughs> uh, but hi, I see you guys in the comments. Good evening to you, Rage. Rickalicious, hello. Uh, and hi, Spider. I am also doing the Golden Apple Archipelago stuff. Uh, moving on that. Uh, be very wowed and jealous of my current C4 Kazuha. So, yes. Haha. Uh, you're feeling better today. Are you Are you asking me or telling me? You asking if I'm feeling better? Uh, then yes. Uh, if you're telling me you're feeling better, then that's good. All right. No preamble this time. I've got maybe two hours of time to to uh, to get through this. So we're going to try and get through three chapters in two hours. Let's go ahead and jump right into the story and start this bitch off. Remember last time what we got. Let me get a sip of water. Mm, there we go. Last time. Uh, an old man showed up and talked to Rudius, and we found out it was future Rudius, and he was warning uh, our current Rudius not to uh, just simply check, but to, like, um, kill the rat that's in the basement because the man god is setting him up to end up getting uh, Roxy killed. Now we're going to end up finding out why, hopefully. All right. We all suffered defeats. But life goes on. There's no shame in losing or groveling, for that matter. Author, Rudius Greyrat. Translation, John R.F. Maggot. God only knows why his name is Maggot. But it is. All right. Chapter 1. The Diary, Part 1. It was the morning after my encounter with the man who claimed to be my future self, and I hadn't slept a wink... My mind wasn't working too well at this point, of course, but I needed to decide what to do. My future self had given me a few pieces of advice. Consult Nanahoshi, write a letter to Eris, uh, write Eris a letter, and doubt the man-god without opposing him. I'd written the letter to Eris last night, but I wasn't going to send it until I'd talked things over with Sylphie and Roxy. Depending on how that conversation went, I might need to revise it significantly. The thing about the man-god sounded fine to me. The next time he popped into my dreams, I'd let him know exactly where things stood between us. As for talking to Nanahoshi, I was tempted to go see her right away, but how was I supposed to explain the situation? The whole thing was insane. Then again, Nanahoshi had been summoned here from a parallel world. My story might sound nuts, but she probably wouldn't just laugh it off. First things first, though. I needed to review the diary the one my future self had brought back with him. I had no idea what that book contained, and honestly, I was scared to find out. But I couldn't just shove it in a drawer and forget about it. It was the only record of what that desperate old man had seen and done. The diary was weathered and worn. Its cover was scarred, and the first pages were yellowed with age. Still, the words were at least comprehensible. Bracing myself, I began to read. And I'm going to show you, wow, okay. The... I was not prepared for how small that was going to be. There we are. There we are. Let's get that in there. Whee! Cool. Okay. So there we are. And you can see the image. Nice. All right. I've decided to start keeping a diary. It's been an eventful couple of weeks, you know? I met Perugius and got a few hints about Zenith's condition, and I'll be learning more about summoning magic and teleportation soon. There's a lot I need to deal with, so 
I figure I'll try writing stuff down to help keep track of it all. Aisha was pretty down this morning. She found some weird mouse. Dead, I guess. Maybe she's not a fan of rodents. Apparently someone found a cat with petrification syndrome in the neighborhood. Scary stuff. I'll have to remind my family to wash their hands and rinse their mouths carefully. We just found out Elinalise is pregnant. Cliff looked incredibly nervous, but Elinalise had a big smile on her face. We threw them a celebration, of course. We've got to appreciate the good times while they're here. In the beginning, at least, it read like a relatively mundane journal. <laughs> One entry described studying summoning magic with Perugius. Another mentioned wandering around the floating fortress with Zenoba, looking at all the works of art. There were also plenty of side notes, like, I found a new way to make Roxy squeal last night, or Lucy looks like an angel when she's asleep. I bet she'll be a beauty when she grows up. It was the diary of someone who was clearly enjoying his life. The first few entries were dated, but he'd quickly stopped bothering. That made it impossible to tell exactly how much time had passed. Judging from the old man's story, though, it was probably about two weeks into the future at this point. And that was where things took a sharp turn for the worse. Roxy collapsed today. She hadn't been feeling well for a while, but now she's developed a fever. I'll have to tell the university she won't be coming in to work for a while. I tried everything up to and including advanced detoxification magic, but it had no effect whatsoever. I'm worried it might be something serious. I'll ask Cliff to take a look at her as soon as possible. The tips of Roxy's toes are turning into some kind of purple crystal. I called Cliff over right away to take a look with his eye of identification. Apparently, she's got something called petrification syndrome. It's a horrible disease that can only be cured with a god-tier detoxification spell. We're going to use the teleportation circles to visit Millis and get the incantation for the spell we need. Cliff and Zenoba are coming along with me. Sylphie wanted to go as well, but I asked her to hold down the fort here. Well, we've made it to Millishion. Apparently the church keeps the god-tier incantations stored deep inside the cathedral here. Cliff knows where they are, but the place is off-limits to everyone under the rank of Archbishop. We're planning to break in during the night. Once we get the, uh, the incantation copied down, we can just sneak back out again. We managed, to break in par uh, we managed to break in part just fine. We didn't count on the incantation being a book as thick as a dictionary. It was impossible to copy the entire thing on the spot. We had to steal it, and then they spotted us on our way out. We're on the run right now. We walked into an ambush at the teleportation circle. The circle itself was damaged as, we've, uh, as we fought. It's no longer usable. Cliff was poisoned during the fight. He's unconscious, and it looks serious. I killed a human being for the first time. I can still hear the crunch. It makes me sick to my stomach. Damn it. Damn it! We're making our way to another teleportation circle. Cliff's still unconscious, and it seems like they've circulated our names and descriptions all over the country. We're wanted criminals now. I've made an enemy of the Millis Church for life. Cliff died today. I don't want to write anything for a while. We managed to make it to another teleportation circle This uh, somehow. This nightmare's almost over. We were too late. I can't write anything today. I think I need to write down what happened yesterday. We ran into Eris and Ghislaine at the entrance of the city. Eris started yapping at me, but I told her I had two wives and a family and no time to babysit her anymore. She wandered off looking stunned. Ghislaine shot me a look of contempt before she left. Really pissed me off. When I made my way, uh, when I made it back to the house, I find everyone looking miserable. Roxy was dead. Half her body had turned to crystal by the end. The whole trip to Millis ended up being pointless. I told Elinalise about Cliff's death. She slapped me in the face and ran off crying. I can't stand this. It's too much. We held a funeral for Roxy. I can barely get myself out of bed right now. All I want to do is cry. I don't give a shit about anything. Seems like Elinalise left town without telling anybody. Not sure a pregnant woman should be wandering around on her own, but that's her business, I guess. Sylphie keeps trying to cheer me up. It's not working. Roxy's never coming back. She was so sweet, so earnest. She was the one who brought me out of that house. She was the one who comforted me when Paul died. She was my compass for all these years. And now she's gone. I've been doing nothing but getting drunk lately. When I'm sober, I remember Roxy, and then I start sobbing. Sophie keeps saying I can't go on like this, but what does she know? Was the woman who taught me everything. Lilia started nagging me when I drink in the house, so I'm getting drunk in the taverns instead. 
Sometimes Eris shows up to harass me when I'm drinking. She usually yells a bunch of insults, then takes a swing at me. What's that woman's problem? And why doesn't Ghislaine stop her? Norn isn't speaking to me these days either. She just looks at me like I'm a piece of trash. Nobody understands how I feel. Lately, Sylphie has been coming on to me aggressively, keeps asking me to sleep with her and try to forget about Roxy. She was so persistent, I ended up yelling at her. Why would she say something so thoughtless? Why would she think it would work? It's not just that, I guess. If I slept with Sylphie right now, I'd probably be really rough with her. I'd treat her as a stand-in for Roxy, and I'd take out all my pain and anger on her. That can't be the right thing to do. I screwed up. Some prostitute started flirting with me in the tavern. I was drunk as hell and ended up taking her to a room upstairs. She's great in bed, of course, a real pro. But I guess all the women I've slept with so far didn't have that much experience, really. Okay, that's not the important part. When I staggered into the house smelling like another woman, Sophie burst into tears. She asked me, Am I not good enough for you? And then locked herself in her room before I could say anything. Lilia gave me a real talking to, and even Aisha scowled at me. I can still hear Sylphie sobbing in her room. She won't answer when I knock. I had it all wrong. She was willing to endure anything. She wanted me to throw my pain at her. Tomorrow, I'm going to apologize. Sylphie still won't speak to me. What am I supposed to do? God, if only Elena Elise was here. Sylphie's disappeared. When I woke up this morning, I found her room empty. Well, almost empty. She left behind the clothes and other gifts I'd bought her over the years. Lily ordered me to track her down right away, but I don't know if I even have that right. Sylphie, was the, has, uh, Sylphie has every reason in the world to divorce me. I was, I was, I was, as I was sitting around trying to decide what to do, Zenith walked up, slapped me in the face. She didn't say anything, just slapped me over and over again. I guess she was telling me to get my act together. I decided to chase Sylphie down. From what I found out by asking around town, it sounds like she left for the kingdom of Osara with Ariel and her allies. There are still a few months until Ariel's graduation. Why rush back now? I didn't get a satisfactory answer, but I'm guessing something happened in Osara. I'll have to move quickly myself. I ran into Eris again. Crazy girl started blathering about how she was going to give me one last chance or something, and when I inevitably brushed her off, she started punching me. I was getting pretty sick of her crap, so I knocked her away with magic. She then drew her sword and came after me, so I ran for it. What's her problem anyway? She dumped me years ago. Walked into a blizzard, have to wait for it to die down. Did Sophie already make it past this area? I'm feeling more anxious by the day. Today I made it to the kingdom of Osara, but they stopped me at the border. Since I'm an enemy of the Millis Church, I'm apparently considered a wanted criminal in, the Osara, in Osara as well. I had to make a run for it before they arrested me. I'll need to find some way to sneak across the border. Managed to make a deal with a local Thebes guild. It's a good thing organized crime is so per uh, pervasive around here. Apparently, I'm something of a celebrity to the robbers of the world. I saw envy in the way they looked at me. Word got around about my theft of that incantation from the holy country, I guess. I explained the situation, and they agreed to have a bandit named Triss accompany me across the border. She's a pretty voluptuous woman. I'm worried Sylphie might get the wrong idea if she sees us together. I made it inside the kingdom of Osara. The guild had me disguise myself with a mask and a hood. As of today, my name is Ludo Ren uh, Renoma, conveniently enough. I'm still suffering from a curse that will petrify me if anyone sees my face. This Renoma character is supposed to be a magician from Basharant, who's come to Osara for work, traveling with his cousin Triss as a guide. The guide really put some thought into all of this. Gotta hand it to them. Or the guild, sorry. From what we're hearing in the taverns, the king of Osara is on his deathbed. Rumor also has it that the royal princess, uh, princes are fighting it out for the right to succeed him. The, that would explain why Ariel rushed back here ahead of schedule. We'll reach the capital soon. Unfortunately, the only news we're hearing about Ariel seems pretty dubious. People seem to think she's gathering her forces to launch some kind of coup d'etat. Nobody thinks she has any chance of pulling it off, though. Ariel's not stupid enough to start a fight she can't win. It's just a rumor. We made it to ours today. Triss spotted Eris in a tavern while gathering information. Did the girl follow me all this way? No, that can't be it. Osra was her homeland, right? We probably just ended up in the same city by coincidence. 
Ariel's gone underground from the sound of things, and of course Luke and Sylphie went with her. I'm not sure where to start looking for them. We can't find them. Triss seems to think they already left the capital, but who knows where they headed. The only thing that comes to mind is, well, maybe Ariel's joining forces with Luke's family or something. Tomorrow morning, I'll guess we'll head for the region ruled by the Notos Grey Rats. We made our way to the Milbots region where Pylemon Notos Grey Rat rules. On our way here, we heard a rumor that Ariel's hiding out under the Notos family's protection at the moment. Now I have to figure out how I get Sylphie. Uh, how I get to Sylphie. I feel like it might involve more breaking and entering. For some re reason, Eris was waiting for me when I tried to break into the Notos estate. She beat me up pretty good. After they locked me in the basement, that pile mine guy showed, uh, showed up and verbally abused me for a while. The man's face looks a lot like Paul's, but that's where the resemblance ends. He seemed to be under the impression that I'd come to seize control of the Notos family. After announcing that he'd execute me tomorrow and send my head to the Millis church, he stalked out of the room. I managed to escape easily enough, but Ariel was nowhere to be found. They've launched a coup in the capital. That rumor about Ariel fleeing to the Millbots was a load of crap. They were lurking somewhere in ours, waiting for the moment to strike. I don't know if I'll make it back in time. We're about a day from the capital now. People are saying the coup ended in failure. Ariel had recklessly attempted to simultaneously murder the first and second princes, but they were protected by two powerful swordmasters, the Water God and North Emperor, who'd been brought to the capital as royal guest. The assassination ended in failure. Ariel's forces were wiped out, and she herself had been captured. They're saying she's going to be executed soon. Her forces were wiped out, though? Wiped out? Completely? What about Sylphie? I can't take this anymore. Why is this happening? Where did everything go wrong? I'm trying to write about what happened a few days ago. The, body, uh, the bodies of Ariel's co-conspirators were on display in the royal palace's execution grounds. Luke was among them, and so was Sylphie. One of her arms had been cut off, and there was a huge laceration across her face. A small crowd of people were throwing stones at the corpses. They were throwing stones at Sylphie and calling her a traitor to the kingdom. Whenever they hit the bodies, the crowds that were pecking at the... Uh, the crows that were pecking at their flesh flapped noisily in the air. I couldn't control myself. I burned their bodies with magic, and then I burned everyone who tried to stop me, too. To hell with this country. They all deserve to burn. I rose to my feet quickly. My heart pounded in my chest, and my head was spinning. Reading that had been incredibly painful. I didn't want to continue. Did I really have to read this thing? Was there really no choice? Hurt? A wave of nausea washed over me. This was just some sick story that uh, that old man had to make up, right? That had to be it. I didn't want to believe a future like this was possible. It was too horrible to even consider. No, I needed to read the th whole thing. There was information in this book, valuable, crucial information. <clears throat> when I looked, um, when I looked down at it again, however. I couldn't bring myself to turn the page. The thought of continuing made me sick. What new horrors would be waiting for me in the next entry? I was literally queasy with dread. Okay, I... I think I need a break. Leaving the room on unsteady legs, I headed for the bathroom, and then I vomited into the toilet. Tears ran down my face. In some sense, I'd written that diary, and I could feel the awful clarity... with awful clarity exactly what I'd felt as some as my world collapsed around me. I could feel my grief when Roxy died. I could feel my panic and hopelessness when Sylphie left me. And I could feel my devastating pain when I found Sylphie's corpse. I shoved my face into the toilet and puked until there was nothing left to puke. My stomach was completely empty now, but I had no appetite. I probably wasn't going to manage to eat anything today. After rinsing out my mouth with water, I left the bathroom. Sylphie was standing in the hall, waiting for me with a worried look on her face. R Rudy? What's wrong? Are you okay? She was wearing her casual, everyday clothes. Her silver hair was loose around her shoulders. <sighs> I found myself picturing her dead, her face scarred, her arm missing. Cold and lifeless, hung out for the crows. Whoa! W what is it? Without a word, I'd thrown my arms around her. Her body was soft and warm as ever. Are you still thinking about that battle with the Tofi? Yeah. Really? Oh, uh, there, there. Sylphie murmured, stretching to pat me gently on the back. You know, Rudy, 
I'm always available if you need a little comforting. I know you're not half as strong as you look. I'm always available if you need a little comforting. My future self had ignored those words, and it had cost him dearly. Yeah. Sorry, Sylphie. Oh, it's okay. You know, when I'm really hurting, I might mess things up. I might say stupid, mean things instead of crying on your shoulder. Huh? What's this all of a sudden? But please, don't just disappear on me. Um, well, if that does happen, I think I'd get upset. I might say some harsh things, too, so maybe we'd have a fight, but we can always make up, right? Yeah, of course. Of course we can. Sylphie's so nice. How could I have ever betrayed a sweet little thing like her? Um, Rudy, are you groping my backside? You want me to stop? I mean, I guess it's no big deal, but what? Now that I'd received her permission, I picked Sylphie up in my arms and headed for the bedroom. I wasn't planning to do anything too sexual. I just needed some private cuddling at the moment. Honestly. It kind of felt like I'd just gotten back something I'd lost forever, you know? Although I hadn't really lost her yet, so... Yeah, it wasn't easy to explain, even to myself. Reading that diary had put me in a sad, sentimental mood. I guess I couldn't... I guess I... Uh, oh, I guess. Couldn't hurt to avail myself of a little Sylphie therapy. When Roxy came home from work, I couldn't help following her around the house. When she settled down on the couch, I sat right next to her and started playing with the ends of her braids. What's the matter, Rudy? It seemed my constant fidgeting had gotten to be too much for her. Um, well, I was hoping we could talk for a while. Hmm? We talk all the time, Rudy. Oh, is there something serious we need to discuss? No, no, I just wanted a little er, intimate time, you know? Ah, uh, all right then, but we're not doing anything too physical tonight. Yeah, sure, I just want to, well, cuddle a little, if that's okay with you. It's fine with me, Rudy. With that, Roxy sat back down on my lap and leaned back against me, cupping one hand around her shoulder. <clears throat> I stared down at her face, now only inches from mine. That was when I realized I had no idea what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> And we get a cute little image with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so, how was your day? Oh, it wasn't too eventful, really. Some mischievous student did send the principal's wig flying at one point, though. Oh, too bad I missed that. Let's see, what else? Roxy had spent her whole day at work and was clearly a bit worn out. Still, she took the time to humor me. We chatted about trivial things for a while, chuckling at each other's jokes. I didn't end up groping her butt a little, which earned me a slap on the hand. But when I protested that I wasn't, that I was just trying to cuddle, Roxy sighed and allowed me to continue. Afterward, we headed into the bath together, where I washed her back and massaged her shoulders. Basically, I doted on her like a son buttering up his mother. You seem a little needy today, Rudy. Did something ha bad happen? No, not at all. I was just thinking about how very glad I am to have you safe and sound, that's all. Is that so? Well, I did have a close scrape back in the teleportation labyrinth, I suppose. Feel free to confirm my soundness to your heart's content. The two of us were in the bathtub now. Once again, Roxy was seated on my lap. As I gently rubbed her slender shoulders, I dropped a question of my own as casually as I could. How are you feeling, Roxy? You're not under the weather or anything, right? I'd prevented her from catching petrification syndrome by eliminating that rodent. I was quite confident of that, but I wasn't 100% sure yet. There was a chance my future self had drawn the wrong conclusions after all. What? I'm fine. Why do you ask? I don't know. I just really want you to live a nice long life, I guess. Given the lifespan of my race, I'm quite likely to outlive you. I expect you to take good care of your health, mister. You got it. When I spoke those words, Roxy's face lit up with a big smile. From the looks of things, she really was just fine. Sylphie and Roxy were still alive. Things weren't going to turn out the way they did in that diary. I wasn't going to let that happen. With that comforting thought fixed firmly in my mind, I finally felt ready to face the rest of those awful pages. It wouldn't be easy, but it had to be done. And there we are. That's chapter one. <laughs> Some crazy information in there, huh? 
I remember the first time I read this because it wasn't that long ago. It was like a few months ago reading this for the first time. And I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> like they gave some I wasn't expecting them to actually like go into detail of his old future self and what all happened to him. <laughs> but when they did, I was like, holy shit. New dinner conversation. Say, Roxy, what do you know about petrification? <laughs> God damn it. Petrification and petrification syndrome are two different things, buddy. But yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like, holy shit, all this terrible information coming in at the same time. And honestly, uh, getting through three chapters within the time limit seems pretty likely. We're 29 pages in, I have to get to 72. Uh, for the first three chapters to be done, and it's not even been a half an hour. I thought I'd need more time. All right, well, let's let's keep going. Chapter 2, The Diary, Part 2. The next morning, I reopened the diary, ready to pick up where I'd left off. However, it seemed like my future self hadn't written anything for some time after Sylphie's death. When I turned the page, I found the paper was noticeably different. It seemed like a year or two had passed, at least. Maybe more. The entries were vague enough that it could have been a decade. I had no way of knowing what happened in that undocumented period. <clears throat> but when the entries did resume, I was surprised by how stupid and juvenile they seemed. There was a lot of talk about women I spotted in the street and the size of their butts. One entry uh, recounted my seduction of a waitress at a new, newly opened tavern. Others described my visits to various brothels, complete with reviews of their quality. The language got ugly at times. It was a diary of a scumbag, in all honesty. In one entry, I even took the time to rank all the women I'd slept with. It was hard to believe it was me writing these things. Was this what I'd become without Roxy and Sylphie around? <coughs> in any case, I evidently spent years indulging in this lifestyle. It wasn't clear where these events happened, but I recognized a name, uh, the name of a few taverns here and there seemed like I was still living in the city of Sharia. Some names were conspicuous about, are, about, uh, by their absence, though. I never mentioned Aisha, Norn, Lilia, Zenith, or Lucy. Every once in a while, there was a reference to Zenoba or Julie, but some of those entries made me queasy. My future self apparently had his eye on Julie by this point. The girl had been my faithful pupil since she was a kid. Now I was looking to take advantage of her. I didn't want to believe I was capable of sinking that low. That said, I had to admit, it wasn't totally implausible. In the face of crushing despair, I could imagine abandoning myself to the pursuit of meaningless pleasure, especially since I had the looks and money to make that lifestyle easy. Eris popped up somewhat infrequently in these entries, although my future self was clearly doing his best to avoid her. She was living in Sharia as well, and whenever we ran into each other, she would beat me up with a furious scowl on her face. I'd like to catch that girl and teach her a lesson, I'd written in one entry. But I don't want her swearing revenge on me or something. Probably best to just keep my distance. Pretty pathetic stuff. Reading between the lines, though, I got the sense that my feelings toward Eris were more conflicted than I let on. There was... Uh, was there still a part of me that wanted to patch up our relationship somehow? After what happened to Sylphie and Roxy, maybe I'd just lost the ability to pursue an actual romance. It was hard to say for sure, but at the very least, the bitter words I had written didn't fit cleanly with some of the actions I was describing. <laughs> On another note, there were some disquieting events mixed in with all the debauchery. Zenoba and I had a price on our heads, courtesy of the Millis Church, and I sometimes had to fend off an assassin or bounty hunter. This didn't seem much of a problem, though. I was taking them down with ease so far. I turned the page after one such entry and found another sudden trans, uh, transition in the contents of the diary. It seemed like I'd skipped forward for a second time. Once again, there was no summary of the missing years. Now the paper type changed with every page and I still wasn't dating my entries. Norn's picture book and the Regard figures are both selling well. I've also convinced the university to officially integrate my silent spellcasting techniques into their curriculum. Seems the holy country sent a demand via the kingdom of Osra that Renoa hand me over, 
but as long as the magic nations consider me useful, I can't see that happening. Thanks to the Red Worm Mountains, it's no easy thing to invade a country on the central continent. They put the aggressor at an inherent disadvantage. Or, yeah, I did read that. Also, Osura doesn't seem to be aware that I'm the one who burned a decent section of their capital to the ground. I knew they were scum, but I suppose they're imbeciles as well. Zenova's very close to completing his automaton now. It took longer than I expected, but we're almost there. I can't feel the excitement I did back when we started, though. Why am I even doing this? What's the point? The first automaton's complete. Zenoba made her in Sylphie's image. She has her own will and acts of her own initiative. However, she does anything however, she does anything I tell her without question. She's obedient and meek, but has a bit of a jealous side. She really is the spitting image of the woman I used to know. In almost every way. But this isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I need. I destroyed the Sylphie automaton. I expected Zenoba to be furious, but he apologized instead. That just made me feel guiltier. I owe that man more than I can ever repay. At the very least, he's earned my loyalty until the day we die. Or I die, sorry. We made a new automaton that isn't based off Sylphie or Roxy. Zenoba gave it the name Forty. Apparently it's his 40th masterpiece, according to him. We're mass-producing Forty's sisters now, and the Magic Nations will be buying them from us. It's nice having countries as your main customers. They got deep pockets. I don't know how useful the dolls would be in military capacity, but Zenoba and I refined their design a great deal over the years. I'm guessing they're stronger than your average knight or adventurer, at least. Now that we've reached our goal, it feels like I've run out of things to do. I'll have to decide what my next research project will be. For the first time in a while, I'm actually feeling a little motivated. Hmm. So we completed Zenoba's automated doll project eventually, huh? These entries gave no hints about how we accomplished it, unfortunately. I probably kept my research notes separate from this diary. That was kind of a pity. A little advice in the future might have sped up our progress immensely. It wasn't that big a deal, though. Zenoba was enjoying his research very much, and they say the journey is as important as the destination, right? I turned the page and was startled by another sudden shift in the tone of the diary. This one sheet of paper was basically wrinkled. I had clearly been crying on the page as I wrote these words. The man-god showed up in my dreams. I can still feel his hand resting on my shoulder. I hate him. I hate him so much. I have to get more powerful and fast. I need to kill that bastard. It's my new purpose in life. Until the day he dies. Roxy and her child will never rest in peace. Neither will I, for that matter. Come to think of it, I wonder how Lilia and the others are doing. I haven't seen them since they left the house. I wonder how Lucy's turned out. I bet she's a beauty just like her mom. I hope she's doing well with her studies. I hope she's getting enough to eat. I wish like hell I hadn't fallen apart like that after Sylphie died. Aisha did come back to look after me eventually, but I can't imagine the others have forgiven me. Sending off a letter now wouldn't do any good. I've got so many regrets. How do I get stronger? Do I work on my magic? Maybe track down someone who can cast kingly or imperial spells? I don't think so. Based on what I've seen so far, spells past the saintly level seem to just get bigger in scale. They're not especially useful in combat. There are some exceptions, like that electric spell I came up with. But on the whole, my offensive capabilities are already adequate. The main issue is that I'm a glass cannon with mediocre mobility. I can't amplify my physical abilities with aura, and that leaves me at a major disadvantage in both durability and speed. How do I compensate for those shortcomings? I found some information on the fighting god in a book. Legend has it that he wore a golden suit of armor that vastly enhanced his strength, speed, and endurance. When I discussed this with Zenoba, he came up with an intriguing idea. What if we made a Zalif, uh prosthesis that covered my entire body? I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I can't envelop myself in aura, true, but... When I feed mana to my artificial hand, I can enhance its strength dramatically. If I use my earth magic to create the sturdiest possible shell and then rework it into a full-body suit of armor, yeah, I think this might work. With help from Zenoba, we completed my personal suit of armor. The thing stands more than two meters tall, and it's bulky to boot. It takes a lot of mana to control, too. In effect, I'm the only one capable of using this, and even I wouldn't be able to power it for that many days in a row. It's kind of an oversized hunk of junk, in all honesty. If only Cliff was still alive. 
Maybe we could have made something more efficient, but there's no point in dwelling on it now, I guess. In any case, I took a cue from some old video game and named it The Magic Armor. <laughs> from this point, the diary turned to focus on my efforts to grow stronger. By nestling inside the magic armor, essentially I, uh, an oversized version of the Zalif prosthesis, I could enhance my or the Zalif prosthesis. I could enhance my speed, power, and physical defense to match even the world's most powerful warriors. I could only maintain that level of performance for half a day at a time, but even at 30% output, I was capable of defeating most opponents I encountered. We'd clearly hit on something special, but we presumably weren't the first to come up with this idea. Given the stories about the fighting god, I was already itching to get started on my own version. But were Zenova and I even capable of designing the magic armor at this stage in our research? Well, maybe we're ready, maybe we aren't. I'm still going to make it happen. On a less positive note, it seemed my family had moved out of my house not long after Sylphie's death. That explained why I'd barely referenced them in the earlier entries. I could see Norn getting fed up with my womanizing quickly enough, but I'd somehow managed to even to get even Lilia to give up on me. Just how badly had I mistreated them? Then again, I didn't know the specifics. Maybe I'd move them out for their own safety. I did have those assassins from Millis coming after me and all. Yeah, sure, let's go with that. All of a sudden, I found myself wanting to score brownie points with my family. Fortunately, today happened to be one of Norn's regularly scheduled nights at home. That seemed like an excellent reason to take them out for a meal. A little quality time couldn't hurt, right? Brother dear, came a voice from behind me. Lunch is ready. Come down and eat with us. I rose from my chair and opened the door to find Aisha standing just outside in her usual maid outfit. There was a bit of sauce on her face. She'd probably been doing a little taste testing in the kitchen. You got something on your face, kid, I said, taking out a handkerchief to wipe it off her. Hee hee thanks. Aisha grinned cheerfully at me as I pulled my hand away. This kid had been devoted enough to take care of me by herself, even when I turned into a no-good piece of trash. The old man hadn't mentioned her, but she was effectively the only family he had for years. It must have meant a lot to have her around. Hey, Aisha, is there anything you've been wanting lately? Huh? Why are you asking? I was thinking I might buy you a present one of these days. Just a little thank you for all the hard work, you know? What? Aw, you shouldn't feel bad for... Uh, uh, you shouldn't. I'd feel bad for Norn. Hmm, but I guess I did see a really cute hair clip in the store the other day. Wink, wink. You're not actually supposed to say the wink, wink part out loud, you know. Who did she learn this kind of shamelessness from, anyway? Me? Probably me. All right. I'll take you out to buy it. All right. I'll take you out to buy it sometime soon. We'll just have to keep it a secret from Norn. Aisha let out an odd little yelp as uh, uh, as she jumped back and threw her hands up in an exaggerated display of shock. Are you actually serious, Mother dear? What are you planning in it here? <gasps> Could it be you're craving some love? Some loving? Should I be awaiting your arrival in my bedroom tonight, my lord? Tee <laughs> Okay, enough fooling around. Let's go eat before the food gets cold, huh? Yes, sir! Together, the two of us headed down to the dining room. Roxy and Norn weren't around at this moment, but we had a family meal with everyone else in the house. To me, at least, the food tasted noticeably better than usual. When I shared that thought with Lilia, I managed to get a little smile out of her. After lunch, I returned to the diary. With his magic armor complete, my future self began to travel the world, searching for a way to reach the man-god. I met many people in the course of these journeys, but was frequently distressed by how little information I could find out about my enemy. Eventually, I hit on the theory that people who'd been alive for a very long time were more likely to know something about the man-god, and focused my attention on locating the oldest people in the world. At the same time, I continued to train relentlessly as a mage and develop new spells, gradually growing more powerful than before. In time, I mastered gravity manipulation a variety of electric spells, and even the kind of magic that manipulated the human voice. I also reached the saint tier in healing. At some point, I came to the conclusion that magic itself was all-powerful and could be used to accomplish anything as long as you got the knack of it. Naturally, there was no explanation of what the heck that was supposed to mean. 
This was also the section of the diary where I'd record, recorded my theories about Roxy catching petrification syndrome from that mouse and the man god's potential responsibility for Sylphie's death. At a glance, it seemed like I was making progress on many fronts, but as more time passed without any new information about the man god, my future self began to grow increasingly bitter and hateful. At this point in my life, I'd become a genuinely horrible person. I provoked fights everywhere I went, crushing opponents much weaker than me just so I could sneer at them. I acted on impulse and instinct, even sexually assaulting random women. This sure as hell wasn't the kind of man I wanted to become. Eris made frequent appearances in these entries as well. She kept popping up along my route as I traveled around the world. Eris was as powerful as ever and repeatedly defeated me in battle. There was no clear mention of this in the text, but she might have been trying to show me the error of my ways. My future self, however, began to think of uh, think she might be an agent of the man-god. She was interfering with my progress, after all. Therefore, she was clearly under his control and acting to protect his interest. Over time, I grew to hate her for it. I was amazed how easily I'd convinced myself of this, despite lacking any evidence whatsoever to support the theory. It was probably just what I'd wanted to believe. <laughs> Eventually, Eris stopped beating me so easily and then stopped beating me at all. Maybe I'd grown stronger, or maybe she'd passed her peak physical years. I couldn't tell from the text. Finally, things came to a climax. I made Eris cry. It's been a long time since I saw her blubber like that. Maybe I took things too far. She might not be connected to the man-god at all. No, that doesn't make any sense. The woman's been following me around and getting in my way ever since Sylphie died. What else could explain that? She clammed up repeatedly during the interrogation, too. She knows something. She has to. Eris escaped today. I found her handcuffs with bite marks on them. Are that woman's teeth made of steel? Damn it all. I have an audience with a Tofe tomorrow. It's hard to imagine that muscle head will give me anything useful. But like most of the immortal demons, she's been around for ages. There's a decent chance she knows about the man-god. I'll get it out of her, even if I have to beat her to a pulp. Eris is dead. Ghislaine blamed me for everything. None of this makes any damn sense. I'm going to try and summarize what happened yesterday. My audience with a Tofe turned into a battle. I was up against her and her entire personal guard. I was confident I could handle the Demon King, but more threw me off completely. I knew the man was a powerful mage, and I still let him catch me off guard. I was too focused on a Tophie herself. They had me on the ropes when Eris jumped in out of nowhere. She took an attack meant for me and died to save me. Ghislaine told me why afterward. She explained everything, going back to the day Eris showed up in Sharia. Eris just wanted to be with me. I had it all, ro I had it all wrong all this time. She never stopped loving me. Ever. That was the reason she followed me around. It was the only reason. I still can't believe it. There wasn't much detail in these entries, but it all matched up with what the old man had told me. Maybe I really did need to marry Eris, too. Reading all this made me want to see her and end up happy. It was going to take some real courage to take the first step, though. I had vaguely broached the subject with Sylphie, but still... Well, the real first step had to be talking it over in detail. Sending the letter would come after that. I decided to push this topic from my mind until Roxy came home tonight and returned my attention to the diary. After Eris's death, there was a sketch of entries that said nothing particularly useful. I had written only brief descriptions of traveling to certain places, meeting certain people, and fighting others. Among those I battled, I noticed some truly fearsome opponents. A water emperor here, a north emperor there but my victories didn't seem to bring me any pleasure, as I hadn't even bothered to record any details. Most of the entries were nothing more than a sentence or two along the lines of, I killed X today. He didn't know anything about the man-god either. After a, fair number of, after a fair number of entries like this, there seemed to be another skip forward in time. The first longer entry, in a way, was of a very different nature from those that had preceded it. Zenoba's gone. A unit of temple knights had infiltrated the kingdom of Renoa about, uh, without anyone noticing. By the time I rushed back, it was too late. They'd burned the mansion to the ground. I found Zenoba's charred body in front of the door in the basement. Ginger, Julie, and Aisha were laying inside it, their bodies cut to pieces. The temple knights were still in Renoa, so I tracked them down and killed them all. But murdering them was meaningless, of course. 
Zenoba did so much for me. He tried so hard to help me and to protect my family. But I wasn't there for him when he needed me. Oh, God, they killed Aisha. Okay, Jesus. What's the point of having all this power anyway? I'm useless. Everyone's dead now, I guess. I'm the only one still standing. The others are all God, and I couldn't protect any of them. It's all the man's God, the man God's fault. I have to kill that bastard if it's the last thing I do. Well, that was a downer. Losing both Zenoba and Aisha in such a horrible way must have been crushing. That said, I was slightly curious why my future self hadn't tried to locate the rest of my family. Maybe I'd decided that I had no right to call myself Lucy's father, or maybe Lilia and the others had died as well, and those events just weren't recorded in his diary. Norn's name hadn't come up in a very long time, which was exact wasn't exactly reassuring. Okay, let's stop speculating. If it wasn't in the diary, it hadn't happened. That was how I needed to approach this. In any case, I didn't. it didn't seem like Zenoba's death was necessarily the man-god's doing, but my future self was blaming everything on him. <coughs> At this point in my life, I'd clearly developed a single-minded obsession with taking revenge. I threw myself into the search for the man-god even more intensely than before, viciously butchering anyone who stood in my way. And finally, I found a lead. <clears throat> My heart is pounding as I write this. I'm currently in a remote corner of the Begarit continent. This was said to be an uninhabited, unexplored region, but I discovered an ancient ruin here, a remnant of the ancient dragonfolk civilization, and on its walls I found murals lined with writing. This is what I read on one of them. This world is divided into six. The world of dragons, the world of men, the world of demons, the world of beasts the ocean world, and the sky world. These six worlds are arrayed like the faces of a great cube. The inside of this cube is a place known as the barren world. Passing through it is the only way to travel from one place of uh, one face of the cube to another, but this is only possible by means of a very specific method. <coughs> <clears throat> Unfortunately, the mural had crumbled away after this section, but the very last legible sentence reads as follows. The man-god stands at the center of the barren world. I finally found what I was looking for. I'm planning to stay here for some time to thoroughly analyze everything written on these walls. The murals contain a historical record of the dragonfolk's attempts to find a way to the barren world's center. <clears throat> Summoning and teleportation magic were apparently developed as offshoots of their research into spells for traveling through the barren world to reach others. I may need to focus my research in that direction. I found everything there is to find in these ruins. It seems the ancient dragon folk attempted to create something that would allow them to reach the center of the barren world. But I don't know what that something was. <laughs> the section of the walls describing it have crumbled into dust. Still, their method was clearly something quite similar to summoning or teleportation magic. Unfortunately, I don't know the knowledge I need to recreate the kind of spell that was described. Perugius might, however. I don't know if anyone... I don't know of anyone more familiar with summoning spells. Perhaps he can point me in the right direction. <clears throat> Perugius knew nothing. He doesn't even know who or what the man-god is, for that matter. The only thing he does know is that Lapless flew into a furious rage at the mention of him. I'm back to square one yet again. Lapless clearly knew the man-god, but he's no longer among the living. I suppose there's Orsted. Maybe he knows something. I can't find so much of a, as a rumor about Orsted's whereabouts. I don't think I'll ever track the man down, no matter how hard I try. Maybe I'm better off focusing on my research on teleportation magic. After decades of constant battle, I can't move as nimbly as I used to. I may not have much time left to waste. No, it's too early to throw in the towel. I should try to find more dragonfolk ruins while I'm still capable of traveling. <coughs> huh. 
So this world was sort of like a hollow cube with the man god at its center. That was a little disturbing. It did explain why teleportation always felt like getting sucked under the ground. We were being pulled into the barren world and traveling through it to your destination. <laughs> of course, that didn't mean you could just dig down through the ground to reach the man god. The connection between the worlds probably wasn't literal. The diary seemed to jump forward in time again after this entry. My future self really hadn't been too consistent with this thing. I discovered a second dragonfolk ruin high in the mountains of the demon continent. I wish I understood why they built these things in such dangerous, well-hidden places. This whole area swarming with powerful monsters. Hmm. I suppose Perugius's floating fortress might also qualify as a ruin, in some sense of the word. Maybe this is a number three, then. In any case, I plan to start exploring it tomorrow. My efforts were rewarded. I found a complete version of the mural I studied some years ago, including the section describing their method for reaching the center of the barren world. The ancient dragon folk created five sacred treasures. Using all five sends you to the barren world instead of merely passing through it. I finally found a way to reach the man-god. Finally. But I'm over sixty now, and my body is in terrible condition. I don't know if I'll make it in time. I paid Perugius another visit. This time, he had information for me. The five sacred treasures created by the ancient dragon folk are held by their five generals. All of them are necessary to open the door to the barren world by means of the dragon god's secret art. However, one of these generals is already dead and their treasure is lost. The whereabouts of their successor are also unknown. Perugius believes that the missing general will appear within a few decades. Something about the way he worded this struck me as odd, but I can't remember exactly why. Lately, it's getting harder to pry open the cabinet of my memories. Is Perugius still hiding something from me? It's an infuriating thought, but he's the only person left who I can reminisce about the better days with. I don't want to kill him. He did say that Orsted might know something about the secret art, but nobody has the slightest idea where Orsted is. In any case, if it's going to be decades before the last dragon general appears, there's no hope left for me. I'm sure I won't live that long. My body's already on the verge of breaking down. I can feel death creeping up on me. What am I supposed to do, damn it? I'm running out of time. I can't get my hands on all five of the dragon general's treasures. I don't think I'm capable of reaching my own... Im uh, uh, creating my own imitations or reproducing the secret art itself. There's just not enough to go on. I wouldn't know where to start. In other words, I can't make it to the barren world. I'm so sick and tired of this. How long do I have to keep struggling forward alone? Who am I even doing this for? Even my hatred for the man-god is starting to dull. I'm just so damn tired. The fire and determination of the earlier entries was giving way to resignation and bitterness. There weren't many pages left. These entries were probably from about 50 years in the future then. My future self had spent decades struggling constantly with precious few resources or successes and never reached his goal. After a certain point, anyone would have grown too exhausted to think straight. The person I was today would probably have given up much earlier. I usually keep my research notes separate from this diary, but I'm going to add an entry here about my latest theory. During my research into teleportation magic, I arrived at an interesting thesis, specifically by combining it with the magic described on the ancient murals and tweaking the execution, it might be possible to travel back in time. However, if my theory is correct, it could require an enormous amount of mana to travel even a few seconds backward. How much would you need to jump back years, then? I'm going to try traveling to the past. I still have this old diary on my hands, using it as a focal point. I just might be able to jump back to the day I started writing it. The day the man-god tricked me into releasing that mouse and killing Roxy. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know what will happen to me if it does work, either. I'm familiar with the concept of time paradoxes, after all. I wish I were more confident this will work. It's hard to even say if I'll jump back in time as I am now, or just revert to my younger self. 
Assuming it's the former, though, I need to go over what I'm going to say. At the very least, I need to cover the petrification syndrome incident, Eris, and the man-god. I'm not sure I'll be able to explain it all. I'm not sure my younger self will even believe me. And if I revert instead, I don't know how I'll be able to interact with Sylphie and Roxy. I do want to see them again, of course. I want to tell them how sorry I am, but the thought of overriding the mind of a happy young man with mine is honestly kind of sickening. Perhaps I should take more time to experiment first, but given the potential risks of a time paradox, I'm hesitant to do so. Say I were to hop back several days in time. What if I leave my memories behind in the process? I'd be trapping myself in an endless, meaningless loop, dooming myself to live in this miserable world for all eternity. At least I'd get to see Roxy and Sylphie again the other way. All right. Enough of this. I'm going to stop overthinking things. It's not like I have anything left to lose anyway. I accomplish nothing with my life. I'm a waste of oxygen. Maybe I'll screw this up and ruin everything again, but so what? Why should I give a damn? And if I succeed? Well, maybe I can give the man-god a taste of his own medicine. And now we see the back cover of the book. By the way, do you like how I started aging the voice of Rudy as time went on? I don't think I was doing that consciously at first. I was just kind of doing it, and then I noticed I was doing it, and I was like, yeah, it seems like a good idea. <laughs> I was trying to do something that made the diary voice and my Rudy voice sound at least slightly different. <clears throat> All right, so here's the thing. I don't know how this is going to go, but this is season three content that we're checking out now. So I don't know. We'll get when season three comes out. I guess we'll know. Oh, boy. <sighs> Once I finished reading the final entry, I closed the diary. The back cover was scarred and battered. Just like the front. Now that I'd read the whole thing, I could see the meaning in those scratches. They were testaments to the long, painful years I'd spent carrying this thing around. My future self must have jumped back in time immediately after writing that final entry, only to realize he'd run out of mana in the process. I couldn't begin to understand the principles behind using teleportation magic to travel back in time. That said, I wasn't sure why he'd come back in one great leap. Based on what he'd written in the diary, it might have been safer to hop back in multiple steps to avoid this mana issue. Was he just too old and tired to realize the benefits of that approach? No, it probably hadn't even occurred to him that he might not have enough mana for this. That man must have had absolute confidence in his ability to cast any spell. In any case, this diary simply didn't hold all the details I needed on his research. There was no guarantee that the conclusion he'd drawn were entirely correct either. Or the conclusions, sorry. <laughs> he could have misinterpreted those ancient murals, for one thing. Come to think of it, I had seen an old mural in the underground levels of Perugius's fortress. Was that the sort of thing we were talking about there? That one didn't seem to have anything to do with summoning magic, but from the sound of things, there were many others of its kind hidden away all across the world. Anyway, for now, I had answers to my most important questions. Now I needed to take action before I ended up going down in, uh, the same road. Hello, everyone, called a voice from the entrance hall. I'm home. Roxy was back from work. Perfect timing. First things first, then. Tonight, I needed to have a serious discussion with my two wives. They needed to know about Eris and the fact that we were all in danger. And that is chapter two, baby. Look at that. Man, five o'clock on the dot. <sighs> I've still got an hour before I have to record stuff. I think I think today I have to record stuff, right? Hang on. Let me double check. I think it is today. Okay. Uh, let's see. 
have to look up conversations between myself and others. Aha, there it is. Uh, actually, hang on one second. Seems I don't have anything scheduled for... Oh, it was probably the other day. Yep, I'm an idiot. Okay, well, we're still only going to read the three chapters here because there's like... Hang on. How many chapters are in this book? Again. There's 13 chapters in this book. So, yeah, dude. We're going to we're gonna move on. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a lot next week. I'll probably read five chapters. But these chapters are insanely quick. All right. Chapter three, resolve. Now this is from Sylphie's perspective. So we get Sylphie at Rudy had been acting strange lately. He spent entire days holed up in his study and then came out looking pale and anxious. What exactly was he doing in there? I was getting worried, but he wouldn't give me a straight answer when I asked about it. My last attempt had ended with him dodging the question and pulling me into bed with him. I was sure he had something on his mind, though. And it was really starting to bother me. I went to Roxy to ask for advice and found out she felt the same way. So you noticed as well, Sylphie? I'm afraid Rudy tends to keep things bottled up inside. Let's try to be ready in case he needs our support. I decided that if things dragged on like this much longer, we might need to press him for some answers. But then, just after dinner, Rudy finally broke his silence. Um, Sylphie, Roxy, could I trouble the two of you to come be, uh, come by my room this evening? His tone was a little awkward, but that wasn't too unusual. It was just the way he tended to speak when he wanted to sleep with both of us at once. I never really understood why he felt so hesitant about these things. It wasn't like he had anything to feel guilty about. In any case, Roxy and I made our usual preparations that evening. We took a bath together and washed each other carefully, then put on some perfume we reserved for these special occasions. I changed into a set of underwear I'd bought recently and picked out a nightgown to go with it. Rudy seemed to prefer the soft ones with sleeves over the simpler kinds, so I went with something relatively modest. I looked down at myself and considered undoing two of the front buttons to expose a little more skin. It wasn't exact I wasn't exactly busty, so it probably wouldn't be that alluring, but I did want to earn as much of his attention as I possibly could. What if he thinks I'm desperate, though? No, and this is Rudy we're talking about. It's fine, right? It'll be fine. Just the other day, I noticed him looking down my shirt when I left a few buttons undone. I think he was trying to be subtle about it, but it was really obvious. He seemed to be enjoying himself, though, so I pretended not to notice. He carried me off to bed a little later. Roxy was wearing her usual one-piece nightgown. She didn't seem to have anything on underneath it, though. She was pretty aggressive in her own right. Anyway, the two of us were now primed and ready. We took a few deep breaths, then headed to Rudy's room or headed to Rudy's bedroom. Rudy was sitting quietly in his chair, waiting for us. Roxy and I sat down on the bed next to each other. I sat on the right and Roxy on the left. We'd never decided our places beforehand, but it was a bit of a habit by now. Rudy would usually wiggle his way in between us with a leering grin, but today he looked a little different. There was a serious expression on his face, and he wasn't moving from his chair. After a long moment, he cleared his throat and turned to Roxy. Uh... Roxy? Yes? How's Norna quitting herself at school? Uh, yeah. Uh, quitting herself? Really? What a weird choice of words. Roxy seemed a little amused as well. Why ask me? Didn't Norn tell you herself just the other day? Well, I was hoping to get some candid impressions from you as an educator. How long was he going to keep talking like this? It was getting harder not to laugh. Uh, all right then. Her academic performance is average. She's making fairly slow progress with the sword. I'm impressed by her efforts with the student council, though. She seems to be earning some recognition for her disciplinary work in particular. The university has quite a few rowdy students, but everyone listens when she scolds them. I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that you're her brother, but she's also earned a great deal of affection from some of the older students. Either way, no one ever tries to pick a fight with her, and she seems... 
to have lots of friends. I don't think you have anything to be worried about. Hmm, I see. Thank you very much. She wasn't exaggerating either. Norn really was doing her best out there. From what the student council members told me, she was probably the hardest worker they had. Sometimes I wished I could be more of a big sister to her. And how about you, Roxy? What do you mean? Has anything been bothering you lately? I don't know. Maybe you've been getting peckish a lot, grabbing lots of snacks from the kitchen? Uh, no, you've actually been pushing so much food on me lately that I'm a little worried I might put on weight. How are things going at school, then? Oh, well, well enough. I suppose there are a few students who make fun of me for being so short or refuse to pay attention to my lectures, but that's fairly rare. What? They're ignoring your classes? A bunch of hopeless ingrates! How about I teach them a remedial lesson in manners, Roxy? I'll make sure they gravel at your feet next time they see you. Huh? N no, I don't think that's necessary. This just comes with the territory when you're a new teacher, really. But thank you for the offer, anyway. Roxy bowed her head at, to Rudy, looking somewhat exasperated, but also somewhat bashful. I noticed she was playing with the ends of her braids. I understood how she felt. It made me feel a little envious sometimes, just seeing how deeply Rudy respected her. Anyway, Roxy continued, I guess there's one other thing that's been on my mind. And what's that, if you don't mind my asking? Roxy paused and shook her head. I'd prefer to be sure about this one before I tell you anything in particular. I look forward to hearing all about it, then. Oh, I think I know what this is about. Come to think of it, Roxy had mentioned feeling a little bit odd lately. Maybe I'd had to arrange for a little celebration? Or was that too premature at this stage? We didn't know for sure yet, after all. All right, then. Sylphie? Yes, Rudy? As the conversation turned to me, I tilted my head to one side and tried to look as charming as possible. Rudy's line of sight drifted down from my face toward my upper body. My strategy was a success from the look of things. How, um, how's Lucy been doing lately, you think? Well, you're keeping an eye on her yourself, aren't you? She's a happy, healthy baby. Yevon overheard her muttering, In the heaven above and this earth below, I'm alone, my uniquely honored or anything, have you? The heck are you talking about? Um, I think she might be crawling around on her own before too long. Hmm. In the heavens above and this earth below, I am uniquely honored. Wait, what? Okay, I don't know what he's trying to quote there. Hmm. Thanks to Lilia's help, things really were going smoothly with Lucy. Princess Ariel seemed to feel that children were best raised by maids and attendants rather than their mothers. But Grandma Little East told me I should try to give my child as much personal loving care as I could. I did to agree with the Little East, and Rudy seemed to want us both to be involved in raising Lucy. So I'd been putting in lots of time and effort. Have you noticed anything strange lately, Sylphie? Rudy asked. Anything on your mind? Not really. I guess I'm wondering why my husband's hiding things from me, but that's about it. The words just came out on their own. I hadn't intended to be that harsh on him, but... Ah, uh, right said Rudy, averting his gaze nervously. Sorry about that. So there was something going on then. Was he ever going to clue us in? After a moment, Rudy looked back at me. This time his gaze was steady and determined. Whenever he got this look in his eyes, you knew it was Rudy at his best. Actually, this is exactly the reason I asked the two of you to stop by tonight. At these words, I sat up straighter and buttoned up my nightgown. Roxy straightened up as well, although her expression was a little uncertain. The problem is, I'm not sure how to explain. I guess I'll start at the beginning. A few days ago, I met a certain individual. Could you be more specific? Right. He was... something like a blessed child, I guess. One with the power to predict the future. Rudy, sent, uh, Rudy went on to describe his conversation with the person. The details were alarming, to say the least. Basically, there was someone out there who wanted to harm him and his family. Terrible things happened to us if this mysterious enemy had their way, and in order to keep us safe, Rudy might have to do some things that seemed very strange from time to time. To be honest, I wanted to think he was taking this too seriously, but I could tell that Rudy was convinced it was completely true. I could tell he was keeping some of the details to himself. There were probably parts of his story he thought it was better for us not to know. That didn't feel great, of course. Still, I could understand why he wanted to be very cautious about this situation. Okay, then. I said. Is there anything we can do to help? 
I'm sure there will be, to be honest, though. I'd rather not put the two of you in too much danger. There he goes again. This has been coming up a lot with Rudy lately. I felt like it had started right after his father's death. It was nice to know he cared so much about us, but he could get a little overprotective sometimes. I wasn't a helpless child anymore. I could pull my own weight these days. Sophie, bless you. Bless your adorable little self. But you are not capable of punching at Rudy's weight class. You just aren't. As much as, much as I love you, you're just not. You're not. You can't. Rudy's in a whole different league. <laughs> You're a featherweight. Rudy is like middleweight. And if he keeps going, he can punch at the heavyweight class, at least from a magical standpoint. All right. Doesn't that mean you'd be putting yourself in danger with us uh, without us around to help? Can't say for sure yet, but it's pretty likely, yeah. Well, I don't like the sound of that. The battle with the Tophi had been bad enough. Rudy was a powerful mage, but he never wanted to fight anyone. And yet he was always flying off on some mission or other and nearly getting himself killed. Was I supposed to just sit around waiting to cheer him up when he'd limp back home? That was... starting to get old. I wanted to go with him at the very least. I might be able to help out somehow. Then again, the last thing I wanted was to be a liability. Hmm. All right, came a quiet voice from beside me. I understand. Roxy had spoken up for the first time in a while. Fiddling with her hair, she looked Rudy in the eyes and smiled. While you're out and about, she continued, I'll keep Norn and Aisha safe. Her voice was clear and confident. She seemed to have genuinely accepted her role as uh, her role to play. Are you really okay with that, Roxy? I asked. I couldn't help thinking there was a part of her that wanted to tag along as well, but Roxy nodded. I know Rudy would rather put himself at risk than see his family in danger. Sure, but come to think of it, Roxy had been there when Rudy, uh, with Rudy when his father died. It was hard for me to picture just how devastated he'd been by that tragedy, but from the sound of things, he'd sunk into a very deep depression. At the very least, it was enough of a shock that he ended up breaking his promise to me. Ugh, cut it out, Sophie. You're just being sulky now. Rudy had come back to me in the, in the end. That was what really mattered, right? That said, Sophie, I don't intend to just sit around and watch while Rudy puts his life at risk for us. What was that supposed to mean? Hadn't she just promised to stay home? We can keep a careful eye on him, Roxy continued. And if we decide he really needs our help... We'll follow him whether he wants us to or not. Oh, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. We didn't need Rudy's permission to help him. We could make up our own minds. As long as things turned out all right in the end, he wouldn't have any reason to complain. Yeah, I guess you're right. Okay. Rudy listened to all of this with a little half smile on his face. I'd half expected him to try to tell us off, but instead he just listened with something like trust in his eyes. You go off and do what you want, Rudy, Roxy continued, smiling back at him. Don't worry about things back here. We'll keep everyone safe and sound. All right, then, he finally replied. It's good to know I'll have two of you watching my back if things get out. I'll have the t I'll have you two watching my back if things get ugly. There was some genuine relief behind his smile. And maybe it was just my imagination, but I thought his eyes were shining slightly. I had to admit I was impressed with how smoothly Roxy had handled this. There was a reason why Rudy respected her so much. In any case, the most important thing was that he could approach this challenge with a clear mind, and if he got himself into trouble, I could always go help him out. I'd be the good, loyal wife most of the time, but when things got ugly, I'd ride to the rescue. Yeah, that was the kind of relationship I wanted. Um, moving on then, there was one other thing, actually. I'd been getting a little pumped up there, but the conversation wasn't over yet. For some reason, Rudy's voice sounded awfully meek all of a sudden. His body language looked a little different, too. He'd been choosing his words carefully this entire time, but now it sounded like he was reluctant to say anything at all. I'm not sure how to put this, to be honest. Is it an awkward problem? Roxy said gently, trying to ease him forward. Rudy nodded in response. Very awkward. It's not an easy thing to tell you to. Well, now he had me anxious. 
Could this have something to do with how haggard he'd looked lately? Hopefully he hadn't caught some kind of disease that magic couldn't cure. I think, uh, there's a chance we might add one more person to the family. Hmm. Is he talking about a woman? Yeah, that has to be it. Well, I didn't really have any grounds to complain. He dropped a few hints about this earlier, and I hadn't objected or discouraged him. That didn't mean I was ready to give my approval to just anyone, though. My feelings about this weren't quite that simple. Who is it? Nanahoshi? I tried to keep my voice as neutral as possible. I felt like I succeeded. I didn't sound angry, at least. If it was Nanahoshi, though, that felt a little wrong to me. I didn't think she really loved Rudy in the way we did. Her feelings were something more like gratitude. She probably wouldn't refuse him if he pushed her for a relationship, but that didn't mean she'd welcome it. No, it's not Nanahoshi. Well, that was a bit of a relief. For some reason, though, Rudy was looking even more guilty than before. It's a woman named Eris. Eris? What was that again? I'd heard that name before, but it wasn't someone I knew from the university. Isn't that the girl you were tutoring during your stay in the Fatoa region, Rudy? Roxy prompted. It was enough to jog my memory. Wasn't she the person who caused your condition? Uh, yeah, I guess she was. Had Rudy already forgotten how depressed he was back when he arrived at the university? I hadn't picked up on it at the time, but after seeing the way he was transformed by our marriage, I realized that he'd been suffering from a serious lack of self-confidence. That condition was no laughing matter for him. It was hard for me to fully understand his feelings, but I knew he'd been suffering. It had been a bit of a shock for me as well when I found out. Do you still love her, even after what she did to you? Not as much as I love you two, Rudy replied, looking me straight in the eyes. That's one thing I can say for sure. I felt myself blushing. Rudy could be such a lady killer when he wanted to. It was hard to suppress the urge to squeal a little. I almost wanted to brag to Linnea and Persetta about that line. It was a shame they weren't around anymore. God, stop it, Sylvie. Focus. We're talking about this heiress person. Don't let him distract you. Okay, so... Is she the one who wants to make up with you? Even though she dumped you? Well, that's the thing. I might have been wrong about her dumping me. It sounds like her feelings never really changed at all. Maybe so, but she still broke your heart, right? Yeah, that's true. In theory, I didn't have any real objection to Rudy taking on a third wife. I'd come to terms with our arrangement by now. It wasn't like I didn't want to have him all to myself, of course, but Rudy wasn't a member of the Millis Church, and I knew I wasn't strong enough to support him all by myself. As long as it was someone who loved him and whom he loved, I wasn't going to object. I'd made up my mind about that some time ago. But we were talking about someone who'd hurt him deeply in the past. That made things a lot more complicated. You know, Rudy... I still remember how sad and desperate you were. Yeah. Back then, I couldn't have forgiven Eris. Just the idea of seeing her again probably would have terrified me. So why were things different now? Maybe it had something to do with that blessed child he'd run into the other day. They might have made some prediction involving her. That didn't feel like a good enough reason to me, though. I mean, if someone had told me, you're going to marry a man named Rudius and have five children with him... It would probably have been pretty exciting, but I wouldn't have run out and married the first guy named Rudy as I could find. Did it really make sense to Rudy to marry this woman if he wasn't even sure that he loved her? If you're firmly opposed to the idea, I won't marry her, but at the very least, I think I need to see her and talk things through. Rudy paused and frowned as if something had just occurred to him. You know, the thing is, Eris has been training in a place called the Sword Sanctum for years now. And it sounds like she was doing it for me. Wouldn't it be kind of harsh to just shoot her down when she finally comes back to rejoin me? Well, yeah, I guess it would be. I could kind of imagine how pitiful it would ha uh, it would be to have the rug pulled out from under you like that after years of hard work. I'd put in a lot of effort myself back in Buena Village trying to catch up with Rudy. I'm not really saying I'm opposed or anything... What if the displacement incident had never happened and Rudy had never bothered returning to Buena Village? What if I'd tracked him down only to find him married to another woman? That would have been one heck of a shock. It's just... I don't know. I've never met this person. That was the heart of the issue, really. 
I didn't know Eris at all. Until this moment, I'd always thought of her as a cruel person who'd mistreated Rudy. It sounded like that was a misunderstanding, though. That hadn't meant... She hadn't meant to hurt him, right? Could I interject? Said Roxy, interrupting my circular train of thought. It seems to me that we should all defer our decision on this until after we've actually met Eris. You think? Yes. For one thing, I get the impression you're not entirely sure of your own feelings yet, Rudy. Once you see her, I'm sure it'll be much easier to make up your mind. How did Roxy herself feel about all this? The last time we discussed Rudy taking another wife, she'd sounded, uh, she'd sounded accepting of the idea, but it was hard to tell what she was thinking right now. And in any case, she continued, Sylphie already asked you as much. I blinked in confusion. I wasn't sure what she was talking about anymore. You don't remember, Sylphie? I think your exact words were, just make sure you bring her to meet me first. Oh, right. Yeah, I did say that, didn't I? Bring Eris here and introduce her to us, Rudy. We'll talk things through and get to know each other, but if, but if it just doesn't seem like it's going to work out, I'll have to oppose the idea as well. The more I thought about it, the more it sounded like the most reasonable idea. We weren't committing to anything yet, but we could stay open to the idea. Roxy sure did have a good head on her shoulders. Watching her in the action made me feel a little inadequate as a wife. Of course, I imagine we'll have to discuss this idea with a number of other people as well, but... Oh, of course, I imagine we'll have to discuss this with a number of other people as well, but for what it's worth, Rudy, you have my support and my trust. Thank you, Roxy. That means a lot. All I ask is that you try not to forget about me completely, no matter how many girls you end up marrying. Rest assured, I couldn't forget about you if I tried. I'll take that as a promise, then? Absolutely. She was clever and thoughtful, and Rudy trusted her completely. It made me kind of jealous sometimes. No, no, that was the wrong way to think about it. I just have to do my best to follow in her footsteps. I could be a grown-up, too. Just you watch. Hm. Does that sound okay, Sylphie? Rudy asked hesitantly, turning to face me. I'm sorry about all this. It's all right. I'm sorry for being so difficult today. It wasn't really fair of me after all those things I said last time. Rudy and I ended up apologizing to each other for some reason. I could hear Roxy chuckling softly. It was nice, this arrangement we'd made at, uh, we'd arrived at. I felt totally comfortable in this room. It was something I couldn't get anywhere else, even with Princess Ariel and Luke. But now we might be adding someone else into the equation. That made me a little anxious. This girl wasn't going to steal Rudy away from us, was she? And now we return to our regularly scheduled Rudius. <laughs> so we're back to we're back to switching perspectives to Rudius. After the, our conversation, the three of us slept side by side in my bed. I wasn't quite callous enough to try and start a threesome after discussing that heavy. After a discussion that heavy, also Eris's face kept popping into my thoughts, which wasn't great for my emotional state. I thought it was over all that, but the more I thought about her, the more I could feel that old anxiety and self-doubt bubbling up from deep inside my gut. Just as Roxy had pointed out, I wasn't too sure how I felt about Eris at this point, and everything I knew about her feelings had come secondhand. One way or the other, I had to settle things between us. To be honest, though, the idea of seeing her again was scary. There was definitely going to be some punching involved. From the sound of things, Eris had gotten unbelievably strong in the last few years. There was no telling how much or how she might react if I walked up to her with Sylphie and Roxy at my side. The diary hadn't mentioned her attacking Sylphie or anything, but there was no guarantee those entries were totally accurate, and I obviously left a lot of details out. Also, a few poorly chosen words could easily take things in a dangerous direction. I had good reason to be worried. It was hard to guess how many uh, how things would turn out when I saw Eris again. With everything on my mind, it took a while before I managed to get to sleep. That night, the man god paid me a visit. I found myself in a familiar, pure white space. As always, I reverted to the I reverted to the man I was in my previous life. According to my future self, this was the barren world, a sort of four-dimensional space sitting at the center of a cube composed of six other worlds. 
when you use teleportation magic, you traveled through this plane of reality. But based on the old man's research, there was no easy way to travel into it. Here I was, though, standing at its center. What did that mean exactly? Given the change in my appearance, maybe this was kind of a summoning that only affected your mind or soul. The man-god was here, as always, with his usual... Wait, no. He's not smirking for once. In fact, his body language suggested he was in a distinctly bad mood, although it was hard to tell for sure, with all the blurriness. Well, this is no fun at all. Yeah, okay, that sounded like irritation. Had to go and ruin everything. The tone of his voice was low. Had to go and ruin everything. The voice of his tone was low and hostile. His usual carefree attitude had disappeared completely. Jumping back in time to warn yourself? Come on, that's just not fair. And everything was going so well, too. Okay, I get it. You're not happy. Does that mean the old man was telling me the truth? Have you been playing me for a fool all this time? Did you kill Roxy and Sylphie? I guess this means his plan worked. Did he just give you a taste of your own medicine? Questions, questions, questions. Always with the questions. Who knows? Who cares? Doesn't seem like your future self was laboring under... Uh, it does seem like your future self was laboring under quite a few misconceptions, just so you know. Well, he's messing with me again, but it doesn't sound like his heart's really in it. I need to try to stay calm. I need to keep this conversation going. Oh, he needs to keep the conversation going. Will you stop pretending to be some kind of tactician? Haven't you realized you're a moron yet? Oh, shut up. I might be a moron, but I'm still going to try my best. On that note, mind telling me something? Why would you do this to me? Why would you try to harm my family? Hmm. Why would I do that? Maybe I just want to kill them so I can watch you freak out about it. Whatever. Wow, he's really half-assing it today. It's almost like he's sulking. Like he set up some big elaborate trap in a video game and then somebody messed it all up by wandering over to the wrong direction and now he doesn't even have, want to play anymore. Yeah, more or less, you messed it all up, you stupid, thoughtless jerk. Can you just tell me what's going on here? I don't care what your ultimate goal is. I'm really not interested in getting in your way. My future self told me I can't kill you anyway. He told me to s suck up to you, not to defy you. And I'm fine with that personally. I mean... Things were fine between us up till now. Even if you were just setting me up to betray me. You still helped me out plenty of times. You can use me if you want. It's not like I have any reason to disobey you. All I'm asking is that you don't go after my family. Well, aren't you accommodating? I mean, whatever you did to that old man, you haven't managed to harm me yet. As far as I know, at least. You did try to kill Roxy and her baby, but she came out of it unscathed. Since she's okay, I think I can pretend that never happened. I can control my emotions. I want to find some way to coexist with you before things cross the point of no return. Hmm. The man-god paused for a moment, apparently considering something that had just occurred to him. What if I told you my goal is world peace? Would you believe that? World peace, huh? Sounds great. I'm on board. Love and peace is my personal motto. Nothing better than a tranquil day spent rolling around in bed, am I right? Let's put the sex thing aside for now. Sure thing. You remember that dragon god guy, your old buddy Orsted? Well, his ultimate goal is to destroy the world. Wait, really? I wasn't getting that vibe from him, honestly. He's been skulking around in the shadows for a long time, making all sorts of evil plans. Here's the thing. If I die, this world will break apart into a million pieces and fade away completely. So Orsted's looking for a way to murder me. You sure you didn't do something horrible to piss him off? I don't know, maybe get his family killed for no apparent reason? Don't you remember what I told you earlier? I can't do anything to Orsted. As far as I know, he has no reason to hate me. Well, okay then, go on. Orsted is very powerful, but he's also alone. His curse keeps it that way. And as long as he's isolated, he'll never be able to harm me. Why don't you just ignore him then? That was the plan, until you appeared. What do I have to do with anything? Well, you're not the problem exactly. But it seems like you and your descendants are immune from the effects of Orsted's curse. At some point in the future, those descendants are going to join forces with him, and together they're going to kill me. Oh, I get it. So that's why you went after Roxy when she got pregnant. The old man thought you manipulated Luke into dragging Sylphie off to die, too, but he didn't say anything about you targeting Lucy. 
I guess it's my second or third kid who's going to be the problem, huh? Wait, couldn't you have just killed me years ago or something? Why would you let things come this far? Well, when I first noticed you during the displacement incident, I did try a few things just to see what would happen. I'm afraid you've got a very strong destiny, though. It never worked out the way I wanted it to. A strong destiny? What does that even mean? Hmm, how can I explain? I can see a number of broad routes the future might follow branching out ahead of me, and I can tamper with the course of events to some degree, but when I try to manipulate events involving people with strong destinies, it rarely works out in the end. You survived that fight with Orsted, for example, and even though I tried to keep you away from Roxy, you ended up finding her, marrying her, and having a kid. Oh, is that... Oh, is this that principle of causality thing? Like, when you travel to the past to rewrite history, but things end up working out the exact same way somehow? Hmm, something like that, I guess. Huh. Okay. So Roxy and I were destined to get married then. That makes me kind of happy. Can't say I feel the same. Sure, right, sorry. But anyway, why did you decide to go after my kids in particular? I mean, these descendants we're talking about are a few generations later, I'm assuming. Couldn't you just deal with them before they join forces with Orsted? The ones directly responsible for my death will also be born with extremely strong destinies. It's not just you, by the way. Sylphie, Eris, and Roxy's are strong as well, and your kids will be on the stronger side. That said, women have times in their life where their destiny gets a little... vague. Huh? Wait, do you mean... That's right, it's when they have a child inside them. I had to fight down a sudden intense urge to punch the fuzzy figure in front of me in the face. The only thing that stopped me was the gut feeling that I couldn't possibly beat him in a fight. Not that... Not here. Not in this form. Of course, I still managed to fail somehow. Why do you bother murdering Sylphie? Uh, why do you bother murdering Sylphie then? She wasn't pregnant at the time, and she'd already given me a daughter. What? Are we talking about that diary now? Hard for me to comment, but I suppose I was trying to play it safe. On the other hand, maybe it was just Sylphie's destiny to die if she left you at that point. I guess it's possible. God, that's depressing. You know, I really did think my plan was perfect. Once I realized your destiny was strong, I took things nice and slow. I guided you along step by step. All so I could strike in the most efficient way at, the, at your most vulnerable moment. Is he trying to piss me off now? <sighs> Calm down. Don't let him get to you. Roxy and Sylphie are both fine. It's all good. I'm not sure why you're trying so hard to convince yourself of that. You don't think you've won, do you? Just so you know, your children's destinies won't be as strong as yours, your wives, or your descendants. I'm not planning to give up, either. I really would prefer not to die. Well, yeah, I guess you wouldn't. Isn't there some way we could approach this, though? I'm willing to do anything to save my family. Maybe I could start a family tradition of teaching each new generation not to trust Orsted. We could tell our kids all about how wonderful the man god is and how evil that nasty dragon god is. Sorry, that won't work. Destiny isn't that easy to derail. Can you think a little harder, please? I have a pretty strong destiny myself, right? There has to be something I can do. Oh? What, did you think of something? Well, I'm not sure if it's even possible, but there's certainly a chance it could work. Hmm. You did say you'd do anything, all right? Uh, you did say you'd do anything at all, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, then. Pausing for just a moment, the man-god grinned at me like a mischievous child. Go kill Orsted for me. Rudy, that hurts. Rudy! When I woke up, I was squeezing Sylphie tightly in my arms. My throat was dry and my entire body felt strangely cold. Oh, Sorry, Sylphie. I released my iron grip, leaving my poor wife coughing for air. I touched my face and found my forehead covered in sweat. Are you all right, Rudy? Came a quiet voice from behind me. I turned and found Roxy had wrapped her arms around me. I'm sorry. I sat up in bed. It was still the middle of the night from the looks of things. Had that just been a dream? No, not just a dream. Anyway, it was the man-god, no doubt about it. What's the matter, Rudy? Are you okay? Sylphie also sat up and started to wipe my sweat with her sleeve. Roxy was still holding me from behind, rubbing my back gently with one hand. I'm all right. I just had a, a weird dream, that's all. 
Go kill Orsted for me. There was no doubt about it. That was what he'd said. Was he serious? What was he playing at here? Calm down. Calm down. Damn it. Let's just think this through. Orsted was an open enemy of the man-god. There was no question about that. However, Orsted was isolated. He couldn't beat the man-god on his own. That seemed to be an absolute certainty as well. It was hard for me to understand why someone that powerful needed help. But that was just the way things were. At some point in the future, my descendants would end up becoming his allies. Together, they'd make their way to the man-god and defeat him. For that reason, the man-god had tried to prevent them from coming into existence. That was why he killed Roxy and Sylphie. He didn't want them having children. Without my family in the picture, Orsted would never make it to the barren world. And the man-god would be victorious by default. <clears throat> but today, the man-god realized he couldn't eliminate my family. That had to be why he'd ordered me to kill Orsted. Both Orsted and my descendants had to be alive in order to defeat him. As long as one or the other was out of the picture, the man-god would be safe. The question was whether I could possibly defeat Orsted. From the sound of things, my destiny was very strong. But surely that applied to Orsted, too. After all, he was still alive despite waging war against the man-god for many years. How the hell was I supposed to kill him anyway? He was unbelievably powerful. I didn't have any means to hurt him. Or did I? That diary contained a fairly detailed description of something my future self had used in battle. Something that had amplified his power significantly. Maybe I could make my own version of the magic armor. It didn't seem impossible, and I had a feeling it would be extremely effective in combat. My future self had also used a wide range of magic, including gravity manipulation, teleportation, and electrical attacks. He hadn't bothered to tell me how he mastered those spells, though. It was hard to imagine I could figure out the weirder ones any time soon. That said, in my first fight with Orsted, I'd managed to deal a small amount of damage to him with a stone cannon, and my electric spell had done a number on a tofi. In other words, I had ways of hurting him, as long as I could stay alive long enough to use them. I might have some chance of winning. Damn it, this is Orsted we're talking about. Why am I even taking this seriously? Rudy, please, if there's something wrong, please don't keep it bottled up inside. Sylphie looked like she was about to cry. I pulled her head against my chest with my right arm. I reached back to grab Roxy's with my left. I have to keep them safe, that's why. Stupid question, really. It looks like I'm going to have to kill someone. What? Rudy, what are you talking about? Without responding to Roxy's question, I pulled away and got out of bed. Warmth gave way to the chill of the night air. Sorry. With that, I walked out of the room. My steps were unsteady. My head was swimming. I was headed for my study. I wanted to look back through that diary right away to get some sense, however vague, of the way that old man had fought his battles. I was going to kill Orsted. It was the only way to protect my family. I'd do it one way or another, even if it cost me my own life. Oh. As I entered the study, my, eye, my eyes found the letter I'd been planning to mail out tomorrow, if all went well. I scratched out a few lines at the very bottom of it. Maybe I wouldn't get to see Eris again after all. There we go. Chapter 3. In the books, baby. Chapter 3 was the longest one. Huh. I probably could keep reading Chapter 4, but I don't think I'm gonna. Uh, so, that having been said, I'm uh, curious to hear your thoughts on this really curious because like when I was reading this, I was like, holy shit, because all this stuff is happening like one right after the other, after the other. It's a lot of information to absorb, but I'm really, really curious to hear what you guys think about this. So uh, let me know in the chat if you're here on Twitch and if you are watching this on YouTube, post your thoughts down in the comments below. 30 crunches, 20 push ups, 10 heel touches. 10 seconds of planks, 30 squats, 20 jumping jacks. Okie dokie. Not much. Not much was redeemed. Uh, I'm going to go use the bathroom. Guys, go ahead and post. Let me know what you think. And for those of you on YouTube, we'll see you later. Thank you so much for coming by and hanging out with us. 
Really, really appreciate it. And if you could do me a favor, leave some comments, drop a like, and subscribe to the channel if you like this content. Uh, but I'm really curious to hear what you guys think because I want to have this conversation. So I will see you guys later. Bye, YouTube!